website. Um, now I want to introduce the speaker for the next talk. Uh, we have a, a talk that is by uh, June Kim from Princeton University. Is uh, the talk is P4 Campus. June Kim is an associate research scholar in the computer science department at Princeton University. His current research focuses on building better network systems, applications, and tools with software-defined networking, programmable data plane, and P4. He's also enthusiastic about deploying such system in a real network. To this end, he's also the cyber infrastructure engineer in the IT department at Princeton University. His high goal is to make computer networks easier to monitor, understand, secure, and configure. He received his PhD and master's degree in computer science from Georgia Tech under the supervision of Dr. Nick Finster and his bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He did several research internships at HP Labs in Palo Alto. He also worked as a software engineer in South Korea before graduate school for several years. Jun, thank you for being here. I would let you share your screen right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, all right, let me try to share my screen. Is that working? Yes, this is working. All right, so um, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Jun Kim from Princeton um, and I'll, today I'll talk about the Princeton P4 campus. Uh, it's about building and running novel network applications on campus. So I'll, I'll start with the definition of P4 campus. It's basically an initiative to create and uh, deploy experimental but useful network applications on a production campus network. And because we primarily use programmable data planes and P4, we call it P4 campus. And this talk is basically, basically about why we do this and how we do it. And so starting with the why, we all know there is a huge gap um, between the research and production network. Uh, let's say you have a really good idea a new idea, but mostly we just uh, work on small, very unrealistic experiments. And then it never actually gets to the production network. Whereas the production network is very big, getting more and more complex, but the operators and network practic practitioners are still stuck with very outdated tools and practices. Um, there's also a bigger problem that someone might come up with a really bad idea, right? Like, uh, like electric, um, drill with a, a manual screwdriver attached to it. Um, but because it also only runs on small and realistic experiments, it stays as, as a bad idea. So that's that's the whole problem for us. So basically, we're missing this positive feedback loop um, between research and production network. So to elaborate on this a bit more, um, to me, I think the network research pipeline kind of looks like this, where you start with an idea and design, right? And then uh, people work on softwares and simulations, network simulation emulations like Mininet or NS2, NS3, NS3 or something. And then hardwares can come along and then uh, you will actually run some experiments with hardware and synthetic traffic. The next stage would be actually doing it with real traces and ultimately you want to have a real deployment with live traffic. Uh, and the important part is that every step has a feedback loop to the idea and design to make it better. Most of the time we are missing all these three stages, but luckily um, these, these times we do have the hardware and these are programmable hardware, P4, um, some other stuff. That makes us actually run our experiments on real hardware, but we are mostly all still stuck with synthetic traffic. And without these two stages of real traces and real deployments with live traffic, um, new ideas will barely see the light of the outside of the lab. So this is basically kind of like the motivation of the P4 campus. 
But the, here, the thing is about real traces and deployment, it's basically very hard to do, right? Um, because let's say you ask the operator, like, I'm gonna put some program switch in your network, they're gonna say no, uh, because it's disruptive, right? And then there's all things about user privacy in the real traffic. There's personally identifiable information. And also there's generally a lack of collaboration between um, and communication between the IT department and the research community. So it's really hard to get these last two stages. Um, we do, we did, the community did come up with really good alternatives as well, like dedicated test beds. Um, there, were, there was Planet Lab, there was Genie, and more recently the Fabric, uh, Fabric Push and Effort. These are really good because they're real networks and they're WAN scale, they're really big, um, but they do essentially have some limited access to the production traffic. Uh, I think Fabric is in, in a much better position right now because people are thinking about this and it's going to have a connection to the internet and all that stuff. Um, but definitely the past two um, uh, dedicated test beds had some limitations here. And if you think about the campus network, it's actually a very good lab. So campus network as a lab, uh, because there's a variety of traffic you can see on the campus. There's science traffic, there's their data centers. Um, if you have dorms, there's residential traffic. And you know, running a campus is a business. So there's a business traffic as well. Um, another good thing about campus network is it's open and dynamic. So it's generally open to the public. There's a lot of visitor Wi-Fi access going on. A lot of visitors come in, there are a lot of events going on. Um, people bring their own device to the campus and the network itself is very close to user too. Um, some people say, you know, every, every services, enterprise services is just moving to cloud. What well, doesn't make sense to monitor a uh, campus or enterprise network, but you know, it still has a value as an access network and enterprise solutions are, you know, still applicable to cloud network as well. Another good thing about campus network is that, first of all, it's research friendly. And this is a website, if you just go to the IT department campus, network, it says enabling research. So, I mean, a campus network wants to promote research, right? And then there are existing mechanisms to help you do that. There's IRB process. Um, Princeton has this another thing about um, requesting data for research process. So the campus um, and educational systems try to help you do better research as well. So um, this talk is basically about how to jump this research chasm uh, from research idea to real campus deployment and get th those two last stages. Um, jumping over the uh, hoops of you know, just being disruptive and privacy issues and lack of collaboration. So um, this talk will be about sharing the experience we had, how to do less, how to be less disruptive how to preserve the privacy and how to promote more pr collaboration with the IT department. And also we'll share some successful deployments we had uh, with our P4 apps. Uh, we have develop developed it and actually run against uh, real traces and traffic on our campus. And I'll talk about the three of them. We have a bunch and I just cited some here, but there's a lot more, but um, for the time's sake, I'll only talk about the three of them briefly. So let's start with the first thing, uh, being less disruptive, um, becoming less disrupt disruptive. And basically it's, it's about um, working with mirror traffic and then starting with passive monitoring um, apps as a gateway drug for people. Uh, people, I mean like IT departments as well. So um, what, I, what, I, what it means to be doing traffic mi mirroring is basically, um, this is a very crude um, and high level uh, topology of the Princeton network. Um, we have two um, routing paths to New York City and Philly, two border routers and two firewalls and two cores and buildings attached to cores. Um, the thing about this is like our networking uh, IT department team deployed a lot of network taps, uh, which is basically a small device that goes in between links and uh, makes a copy a mirror of the traffic that is passing that link, right? And we deployed a lot of them uh, around the campus, mainly for uh, monitoring and, uh, you know, whether we want to do monitoring right now or some forensic analysis later or debug a problem like that. And a lot of campuses actually do this. So what, what we have at Princeton is there's a lot of tap devices deployed around our campus network and they're, they're mirroring live traffic to a packet broker system 
and the packet broker system can apply some filtering, you know, or, or and, and then forward it to some uh, analytic, uh, some destinations you want. And our, our department team is actually forwarding a lot of traffic to their own analysis tools to figure out what's happening on the network, whether it's monitoring, all that stuff. And what we basically asked was, oh, oh you already have this, and which is very common to, in other campus networks as well, is to, yeah, can we get a sleeve of that packet broker system so that we can also forward it to our P4 switch, right? And then we'll install some apps on our P4 switch and bam, bam, then you have um, real traces coming to our P4 switches and we can test our apps uh, like that. And actually, um, this was not at a hard, hard of a, I mean, there were some hoops we had to talk with the IT department and, and I'll talk about the privacy issues later, but there was, this was actually not that much work for the IT department to begin with because they already had that infrastructure, right? So um, working with mirror traffic is awesome because basically it's very low risk. Uh, because it's little or no disruption to the network. You're not actually in the path. You're just um, getting a mirror on your traffic and like analyzing that. And there's a very high return because you can do real time, real time traffic analysis. And it's a very good um, uh, way to convince your IT, IT department as well that you can help um, if you can do better analysis for free. Um, some tips about mirror traffic is, um, well, tap, tap, there's, they call it tap devices or test, test access points. It's much better than port mirroring. So port mirroring is another thing. Um, I think it's a, a, they call it span ports. Sometimes if you hear, um, there's a thing on a switch or a router that you can turn on, like you're going to turn on a span port so that you can capture some traffic and send it somewhere. Um, TAP is much better than that because it's a dedicated device outside of the switch um, and it doesn't use the resources on the switch, uh, you know, so, so spam will burn a port on the switch and also resources on a switch, so it's not um, always TAP is much better. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of uh, variety of modern, modern, modern uh, packet broker systems out there, they can do filtering. They can remove, remove or mask the payload. Um, they can remove duplicate packets if you're um, if there's a duplicate going on on the on the, on the link, uh, or if you if you um, tapped several places on, along the path, but you want to see don't want to see them happening twice. Um, there's a lot of good um, packet broker systems out there which you can also look into or figure out if your department is having that or not. All right, so. Um, the next part is about preserving the user privacy. And uh, there's two things here. It's about IRB and then data anonymization. So um, how to navigate the campus traffic uh, data access. Um, as a researcher, there's two things. Um, first of all is institutional review board, um, which is about rights and privacy, uh, welfare of human subjects. and you might think like, why is network traffic, you know, uh, a welfare of human subjects? But you know, it's it's basically about privacy, um, and you have to really take care uh, about this aspect when you're doing research. Um, another thing is patter, uh, which is not sometimes um, in present in some campuses, but Princeton does have it. I do know some campuses are having this or some similar thing. Uh, it's more about um, using the admissive data for research. And it's more about the welfare of the uh, university. Like, can we share this data? Um, is it gonna harm us some way? Um, you know, in, is there any security? Uh, is there any feasibility issues? Is there any risk or compliance issues? Why are we gonna get in trouble because we shared this? So they have a whole nother body for the university about reviewing the use of data. Um, so it's, it's good to know whether your university or campus or institute or enterprise has this kind of thing and always check with them if you have to also uh, clear that um, uh, uh, bar as well. All right, so um, because that's very specific to Princeton, uh, let me talk about the RRB more. Uh, so when you're prepping your RRB, like you have to do an RRB before you're going to play with the real traffic. That's almost a, a must. 
So when you're pre preparing the IB applications, you always try to state that you will remove or anonymize all the PII. And you know, MAC and IP address is just some examples of that. There could be more. Uh, you want to say uh, you want to remove all the payloads, of course. Although a lot of stuff are not like you know encrypted these days, but um, it's better to just remove the payload. Um, and if you're not able to do that, you will probably you you will you should state that the operator will run our scripts or programs for you, and only give you aggregate results so that you don't see any PII when you're looking into traffic. And also another good thing always is to say that you're gonna take good care of that data. Uh, the data you will be, be storing and processing will be at the machine managed by an IT staff, not your personal machine, not your personal laptop. You're gonna not take that data to home and you know, or copy and send it to someone else. Uh, always say that you know, the stay, this data will stay in a very secure uh, place managed by a, a professional staff. So what about anonymization? So um, there's a lot of tools out there, which are probably, some are very, many of them are outdated. So, but, but they're, they're still out there. Some are really good ones. And off the, so offline data anonymization, if you go to Kaida, which is a very known place for sharing some traces as well, real traces, one of the few of them, um, they have some good uh, documentation and writing about how best practices and what tools to use for anonymization if given that you have a trace that has to be anonymized and saved somewhere. So uh, those are good resources. Another one I wanna present is a use case or example of P4 app, um, but also an enabler for our research. And it's called OnTask. And it's about anonymizing live traffic as it, as it comes in. So um, basically this program is a P4 program that runs on a programmable switch on a real hardware. And it will, when the traffic comes in as raw, it'll actually anonymize uh, relevant fields and you can configure with the controller which places you wanna an uh, anonymize and then uh, the output of that switch is already anonymized traffic. So you don't have to run any like after offline tools to anonymize it. You already have an anonymized traffic coming out of the switch in real time and live traffic. Um, so, so this is hugely um, uh, useful for us. And so what we basically do is when the traffic, mirror traffic comes in, we first have a hop which anonymizes it and then send it to the uh, servers or switches we want, and then do the analysis. So, you know, as researchers mostly are just bound to the P4 system server on the right side, so they don't see the raw traffic in the first place anyway. So um, this is a really good tool for us, which we use a lot. Uh, a bit more detail on it, which I don't want to go in too much detail. I mean, you guys, probably the workshop already talked about how to do parsing. So the you basically this P4 program is like a packet comes in, this is just the IP header and you parse it. And there's a hash function um, that the built-in hash functions like CRC32, um, you can as a salt, uh, you can also implement your own more secure hash function if you want. And then you take the source and destination IP address, which are raw, and then go through the hash function on the P4 program. And then, you know, you, uh, deparse or making like we we make the packet again with the hash source address and hash destination and an output. So it's basically doing that. And good thing about this, this is online, meaning it's not offline tool. Um, and offline tools take a long time too. If you think about it, like it takes a long time. You have to put, you have to feed the traffic, and then you know you have to all these computations on the server to spit it out. And then there's also a question about how to save that huge data in the first place, right? Um, but the good thing about this is like, it's already it's already done when it comes out on the switch, it's line rate and it's customizable because you can select the IPs you wanna anonymize. Some IPs you can, you can say like, I'm not gonna anonymize. You can also do prefix preserving anonymization, meaning like um, you're gonna do slash 16, like the, you're only gonna hash the last uh, 16 bits or something like that. That's all possible with the ONTAS um, and this program. So it's hugely important for us. And, um, oops, right? Um, so that's, that's basically about the ONTAS program we have. 
Um, the last part um, is more collaboration with the OIT department. Um, of course, you want to tackle problems that matter for them. And then the other thing is having a joint position, if possible, which I will talk about in more detail right now. So collaboration with OIT, meaning like, let's say you finally convince them to mirror the traffic and get anonymized traces for your research. Um, and even before that, when you're trying to convince them, you want to say like, I will try to really help you guys too when I, when I get this. Like, it's not a lost cause for you and we'll do it for free, right? And so you're trying to find problems that really matter for them. I mean, let's say you ask for the help from my operators that, you know, give me live traffic and please anonymize it for us too. Then the, I, I assure you they will not, probably not do it for you because that's a lot of time and effort. But let's say like you tell them like, I'll also, Anonymize, do the anonymization for you. So that, that's how actually on test happened. We said like, you know, you don't have to do anything. We'll just put the P4 program. Um, you can review it if you want but, and test it if you want, but it does the anonymization for you. So you don't have to do anything, just forward us the weird traffic, right? Um, so that's how on test kind of born to help them uh, so that they can help us better as well. Um, they also had some problems, like uh, we asked them, do you have any problems in the network? They actually reported they have a switch that is uh, dropping packets occasionally. Can you help with that? We actually had a P4 program that would um, monitor the queues in the switch and pinpoint the flow or packet that is causing the queue to build up. Build up. Uh, so we had that and, uh, and was a, were able to help them like this, this particular flow or traffic is causing a lot of problem in that switch and probably making packet drops happening. Um, they also had, you know, IT folks also asked a lot of questions like, do you have any latency problems in the network? We have latency problems, Where is the, but it's really hard to pinpoint the bottleneck. Um, so another app we had was P4RTT, which is about continuous RTT monitoring on the passive, passively doing that, not, not active measurements, but like personal, but it's more like looking at the pet, traffic passively and trying to figure out the RTT of that flow. And with this, we were able to see like, is the bottleneck is the wired, is the wireless, uh, which I will also show you later in this talk. So you, you really wanna like tackle these, ask these questions. And if they have these thoughts or like, can you look into this with the traffic you get? And like, it's really good to think about these problems to ask them and, and find problems that matter for them as well. And that will really make you build a good relationship with the IT department. Another um, advice that kind of worked for us is, which might be special, but it's not a crazy idea, is having a joint position. So that's basically me, as, as you saw, uh, heard in the introduction, I'm a cyber infrastructure engineer in the IT department, but also a research scientist or scholar in the CS department. And at, actually at some point that was, uh, my salary was 50 and 50. So I was actually, I was shared among these IT departments, CS department, and I did have this joint position, which is sometimes very good because you have a person that can work on research projects, but also has access to campus network. And basically you are the bridge, that person can be the bridge between the research community and the IT department. Um, because this person is kind of dedicated to help make that you know, connection. So uh, it's not a crazy idea sometimes, actually NSF had some funds for this. That's how I started this position. So it's something to really look into. All right, so um, next I'll talk about some successful deployments we had. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about on the P4 programs I wanna talk about is the real-time operating system fingerprinting. Uh, the second one is about continuous RTT monitoring, which I hinted uh, just before right now. So, P4OF is our P4 research project, which was about fingerprinting OS in the P4 switch. And um, some people thought like, why do you want to do this anyway? Um, but the thing about network policies, when you're writing a network policy, you, you really want higher abstractions than I purchase sometimes. Like say, maybe you want to write a policy based on OS types. Like, you want to block all traffic to and from Windows XP machines on the campus because you know Windows XPs are out of out of uh, um, you know they don't they don't update it anymore there. Um, so and maybe you can say like you don't you don't want these traffic like uh, operating systems 
talking on the network anymore. Maybe that policy you want to uh, uh, actually apply on the network, you can say rate limit traffic to and from eco dot because these image and eco dot shouldn't be using so much traffic. Or you want to say like, I want to actually monitor the OS distribution, how, what kind of operating system do we have on a campus in real time? You know, like these policies you can write in, in high, you want to write in high ab abstractions. And we believe this kind of work can helps you do that. So the idea is that as packet comes in, that you know, based on the host IP, you would you'll be able to label that this is the Linux machine, this is the window machine right in the switch. Um, so this work is based on the POF tool or POF, uh, but POF we call it POF. Um, the premise of this work is that each operating system uses a unique combination of TCP and IP TCP header values, and the POF signature is basically a combination of these. Like it's first, is it v6 or v4? Uh, is it using IPv4, IPv6? And then the time to initial time to live set on the host. Um, does the host set IP option lengths, the maximum segment size, and then the TCP window size and scale. And as they start um, the TCP option layout. So TCP has this optional option and what's the order of them if they have any values for that some quirks and then some payload classes. Uh, so this combination actually is able to do a, become a really good fingerprint of an operating system. That's about the POF tool. And it's a tool that runs in the server, right? If you feed in a PCAP file, it'll try to figure out what's the OS for this source address. And an example of this signature is Linux or 3.11 or higher will have this kind of fingerprint, right? And now if you think about it, like, oh yeah, P4 can actually parse all these headers. Can we do it in the P4 switches as well? And that's basically it. The POF tool itself cannot run against live traffic with high data rate, right? It's basically an offline tool. So uh, the P4OF work is about doing that in the switch in the programmable data plane. So how it basically works is that packet comes in, we do the parsing of the TCP IP headers, and then it also parses all the TCP options. And this TCP option layout is a huge fingerprint. Um, it's very unique for each OS. And then the switch kind of collects all this and then save it in a data structure called POF metadata. And then um, basically before that packet thing is coming, the, the, there's a match action table. I think there's gonna be um, a, a tutorial on this later today, how to do that. But uh, the operator can say for these POF signatures, um, I wanna label it as Linux 3.1 and then drop it, right? They, so they can pre-populate this match action table in the P4 switch so that when a packet comes in and it has this, uh, the, the P4 metadata kind of matches the signature, it'll actually drop right, right as the packet is entering and uh, before it actually exits the P4 switch, right? So this is basically how it works. And of course there's deparsing if you're just, just marking the packet to, have, packet to have a label or not, um, you can also still like let it, let it send out the packet as well. Or maybe you know, the policy was to just you know, pass it through, it's fine. Then it'll um, send out the packet. Right, so we actually did uh, run our, we did implement our P4F in real hardware and then feed real traffic and against three hour campus trace. And this is a result, uh, there are a lot of numbers, but basically uh, the left one is for internal campus host and the right one is for external hosts, like meaning like the campus, uh, the external host from the campus so you know, users from the internet. And um, you can see it basically the second column is the POF um, if you do it offline. P4F is the third column, and they kind of roughly match. Of course, the, the, it's not perfect because POF software tool has un, some other logic going on to figure out, to have a better accuracy, but um, you can see it roughly P4OF is doing a great job on counting the number of Windows and Linux and all the versions, Android, Mac OS. It's very, and also it's, it's surprisingly perfect for Mac OSs. Um, for external, um, it's a bit, harder because there's a lot of more variety of stuff happening on the external network. So it is, but it's still doing a pretty good job, if you can see. 
one thing you might notice is like, well, there's a lot of unclassified for, for both POF and P4OF. That's a very really good question if, you didn't, if you're thinking about asking that. And the reason is the POF signatures right now are very outdated. So one of the future works, and someone can also work on it too, is to figure out the, the more updated, you know, there's a lot of more different uh, OSs out there, but I'm sure they have very, very unique signatures and to have an updated database for that so that this actually is applicable to the two days uh, traffic. Right, um, so that's P4OF. The next uh, application I want to talk about is P4RTT. And this work is about passively monitoring um, the TCP mounted prime beyond the TCP handshake. So this is not just the monitoring the SYN and SYNAC and that, it's more than that. It's more, after that establishment is happening in TCP traffic, um, there's a bunch of uh, sequence and act going on as data is uh, going back and forth, right? And what you basically want to do is do a diff between that sequence and act. Um, based on where the vantage point is, you will be able to actually figure out the continuous um, route to time for this flow until it ends, which is awesome too. It's not just at the start. So P4RTD, how it operates, basically um, simplified, you have a home network or a campus network, which is going to the internet and your vantage point is somewhere in the switch. You have a tap traffic um, coming into the P4 switch Let's say the external leg is, you know, from the switch to the internet, and the internal leg is switched to the um, campus host, and the P4RTT run a program will be running in this program data plane, and a stream of RTT measurements will go to the um, server or collection or analysis server, which we will do some analysis ourselves, or basically you can do some stat monitoring in the switch if you want as well, instead of sending the stream of RTT measurements to a different place. So um, I, bit, I want to go a bit more uh, detail in this, how it works, because this program uh, uses another good feature in a program data plan is called registers, which are stateful, stateful um, memories. So you can actually save stuff. Um, it's like a memory, it's, it's stateful memory, right? So what happens is we have a hash table uh, in the register as a hash table. We use it as a hash table. And when the sequence packet comes in, um, the blue one, let's say A to B, we save that and the, along with the timestamp. And then we say, and always this, this comes with the sequence number and the packet size. So you know which kind of act should come in. And when that act comes in and matches that number with the expected act and the act number actually matches, then you will do the diff of the timestamps to get um, that the time difference between the seek, uh, sequence packet and then the act packet from the, uh, when, when the return traffic comes in. So it's basically joining that um, expected act and act fields to get that timestamp diff in the, right, and all this happening in the data plane. And you can think, of, well, isn't there a memory limit on the registers in the data plane? Wouldn't there be hash collisions? Um, there's also these all these TCP quirks and vagaries of TCP, you know, delay to act on all that stuff. Wouldn't it be this challenge? And yes, it is a challenge. So the research project was mainly also about how to use that memory and in the P4 switch more efficiently. And there's multiple different ways to do it, but just to um, state some of them, it's about also lazy. Some so the biggest thing about memory is like these TCP stuff is sometimes act will never come. That means that you're still occupying that space will, which will be never be um, removed because there's, there's no act coming in. So another of some uh, technique you can do is to lazily expire that entry. Uh, if it's over, let's say like it's, it's been there for over a minute that entry that you can say, probably safely assume that it's like, there's, not, there's not gonna be an act coming in for that. So you can say another entry can safely rewrite that, that location, right? That's one way of um, reusing the memory and getting rid of basically garbage collection of things that will never get an act later. Um, another uh, good technique we do is that instead of hash having one hash table, you'll have a multi-stage hash table. So actually the P4 switch has enough memory to do a multi-stage. 
So instead of having a one big hash table, you can have multiple smaller ones with a different hash function. So when it fails to get into the first stage, you try the first second stage with a different hash function. And if it fails, you go to the third one with a different hash function and so on. And actually this uh, performs much better than having a one big uh, register uh, hash table for this. So this is how we kind of get rid of the hash collisions and memory issues when dealing with all, so many um, TCP uh, packets. So with this program, what you can do is very interesting stuff. You can actually pinpoint an application. So you can do a pre-application RTT along the time. For example, if you know the address of the YouTube server, you can say, um, what's, what's the continuous RTT for this YouTube with, for this YouTube traffic? If you know the accuracy of the Netflix or are you able to uh, identify the Netflix traffic, you can actually monitor just the Netflix traffic or Zoom as well. Zoom actually publishes their uh, IP addresses they use for Zoom. You can filter things and then monitor based on their IP addresses above the Zoom traffic RTT going on, which is very important for uh, um, video conferences like this traffic, right? It's really important that the latency stays well. So this is one way to monitor throughout the connection, how things are going passively. Another good application for the IT team, I think we, what we did was as, as uh, I, did, I actually didn't go into much detail, but before RTT is able to um, measure the external leg and internal leg um, separately based on, it's really, it, it's really based on the direction of the sequence and ACK, right? So it's a sequence to ACK. If, if the sequence is coming from uh, the internet down to the host, the campus, and the ACK is coming from the host back to the internet, and the vantage point is in the campus, you're actually measuring the internal, internal right? For the external, uh, the other way around, the second ACK is the other round, you're able to measure the internet side as well. So what this graph is showing is what's the round to time to YouTube traffic, and you can see two things here. Um, first thing is like, there is a difference between wired um, host and wireless host, which is, uh, which is not surprising, right? Um, another good thing to really look into this graph, but, but what P4RTT can answer is that the internal leg, the in-campus RTT, meaning the host campus host to the switch, campus switch where our vantage point is, that leg for the wireless is huge. Um, uh, when talking to YouTube, right? So you can see like more than 50% of the RTT between YouTube and this host for the wireless is, it was actually from the in-campus RTT. Whereas the wired, like the majority of the RTT was coming from the internet side, um, which is really gives us an idea of how the wireless is working. Um, is it the bottleneck? Yes, sometimes it is a bottleneck. So, with P4T, we were able to answer these questions, which was very valuable for the IT folks as well. Um, to, so cool. So, so summarize my talk. Um, this talk was basically about jumping that Richard's chasm, uh, how to be less disruptive. And um, my device was like, try to work on the passive monitoring and, and mirror ask for a mirror traffic tap and then do the passive traffic monitoring first. Um, how to preserve privacy is like always prepare your RB applications really well. Um, there could be more about that. And then try to use these unanimation tools, whether they're offline or we, you use our tool to do that, which is open for the public. And how to actually do more collaboration with the research, research folks, um, having a joint position if possible. And then try to work on matter or problems that matter for the IT as well, because it's also it's good for your research too, but it also builds a good um, relationship with your IT department. Um, and I did share some real deployment successes, the on-test tool, which you are using really well, uh, P4OF, the real-time OS fingerprinting, and P4RTT, which is about continuous RTT monitoring. And there's a bunch of other apps we, we are working on. Uh, which is also very uh, exciting as well. Um, this talk, uh, uh, you can actually look into more if you want a long version of it. We did uh, publish a paper in SICOM CCR 
called experiments driven research on prolonged networks. So if if you if you want to and have time, uh, please uh, feel free to look at that. It'll have more details of this talk and some other stuff about how to do research um, on real traffic and also using programmable data planes. Um, for our group, um, uh, basically Professor Jennifer Rexford group in Princeton, we also open up um, the P4 projects, the source code to pub public, uh, both sometimes for the BMP2 version and also uh, mostly also sometimes for the uh, the, the code that works for Tofino um, because Intel and Barefoot allowed us to do that now. Uh, you can go to this GitHub repo to find um, the projects we have. So, um, so takeaway of this talk is basically please join our effort. Like if you can do this, please do. Please try to do it because it's all good for us. Um, this is how we can make an impact. This is how we can build some things that actually matter and work in the real world. So let's try to jump that research chasm together, uh, going to, to real campus deployments. And we have more uh, campus applications listed in our p4campus.cs.princeton.edu. I try to update that um, more often as well. And certainly there'll be more from you, you'll, you people on this call and everyone has better ideas always. So um, this is a way to actually make an impact. And thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take any questions as well now. Yeah. June, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, very, very interesting. So if you have any question, feel, feel free to write in the chat window or just unmute yourself. Okay, is it possible to, so I think there's a chat that say, is it, is it possible to expand the P for campus to other universities such that external researchers can use live production traffic from Princeton when testing their P for ideas? Very good question. Um, um, this is kind of hard because um, for Princeton, other universities might be better. Uh, for Princeton, as I said, there's a patter stuff going on. And um, for now, they never experienced, this is very new to them too, right? And and patter kind of says that, okay, you can, they review your, your stuff and then, okay, you can use the anonymized traffic for your trace, but you have to list all the people who's gonna have access to, and mostly they only limit to the Princeton people, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, unfortunate. Um, but um, I'm sure we are in talks with this and, and, and um, there are some ideas actually how to share this. And I, I think Jack Russell, I don't know whether he's in, he had some, he has some ideas in Grant how to make this happen. And I'm sure if we work together, there's a way to, um, there's some process or way so that we can share our data, um, at least some sanitized version of it with the external researchers. Um, and it's, it's an effort, like I think it'll be really good to, to do it, but for now we're working on it, I would say, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm certainly, it's certainly possible that you give us, this happened, you give us our program, we will run it for you. Um, and that assumes that you know we have a collaborating going on, and then we can we can share the data with you. That so and meaning that shared data probably is very aggregated. There's no way that you would know anything. So that that kind of collaboration is possible. That you will give us a P4 program. That's a good thing about P4 programs, right? Like P programs, like you give us a P4 program, we we'll run it for you on the real traffic and share the results. And you know, I, I'm thinking that we can make that decision. Like, uh, probably I'll make that decision. This seems okay. I mean, this is fine, right? You know, because there's collaboration going on. That person is not looking at traffic. I am, you know. So that will work. That that certainly does work. All right. Um, how hard was it to convince your CISO to let tap into the enterprise network? So. Um, it was not that hard for us, right? Because as I said, we really utilized that joint position thing. Uh, when I was hired in Princeton, uh, it was based on Jennifer, Professor Jennifer Reck for Grant and talked with the CISO and they had a really good relationship. Let's hire June Kim, you know? So I already kind of started like that. And, and, and I know the CISO well, I know Jennifer Rexford and it was not that hard because I also, 
worked for the IT department for a while, they had I, I, I built that trust with the staff and CISO. So it was not that hard. Um, but if if you don't have that, it may be hard. So that's why I, I did pitch that it may be a good idea to have that joint position. It kind of helps a lot. Thank you. Um, why is the interactivity much slower on your wired network than the wireless one tab location? Uh, uh, was that was that the case? I'm not sure. Um, I think what you're I think what you saw. Let me try to go back there. Okay, here. Okay, the overall wired is much better, of course, than wireless. Um, I think what you're saying is the red bar. On the red barred side, why why is the red wired worse than wireless? Good point. I think it was just I don't have a good explanation. I think it was just some night when we did the 90 percentile RTT, B was not a long enough trace, but I thought it was no long enough trace, but some there's a small difference, I guess, but I think it's not it's not something substantial substantial that needs explanations. But yeah, good point. But of course the overall wired is much better than the wireless RTT. Um, the internet side RTT is uh, questionable. Why, why is that happening? But good, good, good catch. We, we may look into that more. All right. Uh, where were the network taps you mentioned, similar to something that like passive optical splitter? Yes, I think, so I'm not really, I, oh, sorry, because there's, oh yeah. Um, I think that's basically it. I think they're more of the same thing, right? They're, um, if you search for network taps, I think they're basically the same thing as passive optical splitters. Yeah, so um, they basically, yeah, they, they, they tap on the link and then like they're splitting out or mirroring. Um, so that, that's basically the same thing I, I, as far as I know. Yeah, yes, and Chris Tenji says yes. So that's right. Uh, which such model of vendor did you use? I, I think this is, this is for the P4 switch. Um, we got it from Edge Core, which had the Tofino chip on it. And the Tofino at that time was barefoot, now it's Intel, right? So that's the switch you use. Um, they have better versions, but I think in the research community, mostly they stick with Edge Core switches, um, at least in the US, um, Edge Core switches with Intel Tofino uh, chips in it. Um, um, and if you're uh, 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 in educational systems, I think still still Intel has this research, research program. Uh, they used to call it faster program um, where you can uh, where you can apply for and Intel would grant if you're doing research. Um, and then they have this thing that you can join a forum where you can post questions, you can get access to their compiler, the SDK and all that stuff. Did you use the P4 switch as a packet broker? Um, no, no, uh, we did not. The packet broker system is totally different. Um, I'm not, I didn't get any money from there, but I'm just saying the truth that like we, we Princeton uses big switch packet broker system. And now it's, it's, it's Arista, I think. And um, that's the packet broker system we use. It works well. Um, but there's other packet broker systems, but we don't use the people switch as a packet broker. Cool, I think. Right, any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Jim. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, when you mentioned that um, you were running your, let's say your P4 campus as a part of a, in a way to become some part of the production network. How much of these programs in P4 you are running right now is currently considered production? Uh, I'm trying to think what's the definition of, do you mean like production level uh, is not disrupting the network style? Um, yeah, no, I understand that your uh, infrastructure in P4 is somewhat plugged in the production network and it's not 
in the path in the middle of the network. If it's mm -hmm. if it's if it's if if it's down, it won't affect anything. But uh, regarding the programs you are developing and and using, uh, is there is there any of the applications something that uh, the the IT or engineering team is relying on for their oh, work? Oh, I see. Um, not now, not now, not now. Yeah, and um, um, I guess partially they are relying on the the anonymizer. Right, um, but that's not for production actual traffic. Um, right now, um, right now we are not running anything that that they rely on or use every day. Um, that would be awesome to do um, if we have a dedicated person and 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 really good UI that shows that um, you know analysis or something like that. But for now, we don't we don't have anything that is using used daily by the IT. But that's certainly our goal. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That would be that, awesome. Like if we had the yeah, if we had the if we had the time and and, and you know um, people to really like really make this production level. Um, but you know sometimes the research projects and you know graduate and graduate it kind of stops. Um, but it'll be really good if, if, if and and you can think of like. Um, like if the people think that's really useful, we can really make it production level at some point for some projects. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Right. I didn't. I don't see any other questions. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you again, June. A very nice thank presentation, you. and and in fact, my the research group here at the USC benefit from the work for. Oh yeah, before campus so because we yeah. use we use the source code for a certain projects. So thank you very much. And uh we'll be posting. Would you mind sending me the slide? So we'll I be will. posting everything here on, on the website. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um now continuing with our program, what uh we'll be we will have a break. Um after the break um we will have a short presentation 15 minutes um that will be about tofino pods uh, one of the question actually was what are what are the switches that are being used in p4 campus and and this next talk will be about uh the pods that we have here at usc that use the same switches as those that are using p4 campuses edge core switches with uh, tofino chips so we will be back in uh, about 10 minutes, 2.45 p.m. Eastern time. After that, we'll have two hands-on sessions, uh, and then we will conclude the workshop. So we're going to be back in about 10 minutes, 2.45 Eastern time. <laughs>